very happy to be giving this presentation. I apologize to everyone that our, our video isn't working, so you don't get to see us. We got all dressed up for nothing. Um, but what we're here to talk to you about today is this um, 2018 fire that occurred at the Altona Flat Rock in New York. And we'll get that in more into that in, in just a minute. But before um, we, um, we get going on the research. I just want to make sure that we, we mention that Danielle and I are only one part of this project. Mary Aldred, who you, you see up here in the, in the top right, um, has been doing a lot of the, the soil carbon work that you'll be hearing about and work with, with these wetland areas that are encompassed within the, the fire from last year. And Tim Myhook has been doing um, all of the insect ecology work, um, all of the invertebrate work that, that we'll be talking about as well. Um, on top of that, we would be completely remiss if we didn't um, show off our students. There have been, I would say at this point, well over 100 students, um, both as independent research um, projects and as class projects. You see pictures here of my forest ecology class, of Danielle's um, wildlife ecology class, um, of the wildlife club out on Odings um, at the site and so on. It's just been a really wonderful opportunity. We were already doing lots of research at the um, Flat Rock and now with this fire occurring last year, it's just this amazing opportunity for our students to, to see this. Um, um, and I just also wanted to kind of give you context. In the fall, we teach these courses that you saw us pictured next to. Uh, as part of the Applied Environmental Science program that's um, run in conjunction with Minor Institute um, as well as SUNY Plattsburgh. So these are all day immersion field courses. We have the students for that full day so we can take them out and do a lot of place-based work like you'll see in this talk. Okay, so just to start off with some background and, and a bit of a site description for those of you not familiar. Um, what we're talking about today is located here in uh, northeast, in the far northeastern corner of New York State in Clinton County. And if we zoom in on Clinton County, we can see that the Flat Rock State Forest and this area around the dark green um, spots is all owned by the WH Minor Agricultural Research Institute um, that we um, work closely with uh, as part of the Applied Environmental Science Program Danielle was talking about. And so it, the fire occurred on a combination of the of the state lands and the um, WH minor lands. Um, and we're about 10 miles here from the um, Canadian border in northern New York, just to give you some place context. What's really interesting about this site is that it has a natural heritage designation as S1 G2. Um, there's less than five of these um, in New York and only between six and 20 of these sandstone pavement barrens uh, worldwide. And these sites are dominated by jack pine, Pinus banksiana, um, with an understory of blueberry and huckleberry. You can see here in this bottom um, left picture the, the current blueberry crop growing out there. I um, sampled those a few weeks ago, They're the most delicious blueberries ever. Um, but what you can also see is the, the thick carpet of vaccinium and, and uh, huckleberry that covers most of this forest floor around the jack pine, um, but also these large areas of exposed sandstone pavement um, that um, even now some 10,000 years after this was formed, don't support much vegetation and have very limited soil coverage, which is one of the defining characteristics of this uh, natural heritage designation. The Altona Flat Rock was formed when Lake Iroquois drained out um, in between the retreating ice sheet and the Adiron Uplands about uh, 13,000 years ago. And the outflow from, from this lake um, created this uh, basically scoured um, the, the surface down to the bedrock and it has remained um, largely um, scoured um, up until this point. The Altona Flat Rock is one of the larger, um, it encompasses about 32 square kilometers of um, in area in this region. What's really interesting um, about the Altona Flat Rock um, on top of all of what I just mentioned is that what we're looking at here is a range map of um, jack pine in the green um, extending you know, across much of the continent. And at the Altona Flat Rock, if we go to the zoom in panel here, you can see we're very near the southern range limit of the jack pine in um, all of North America. 
Um, there is a few scattered populations in, in Michigan and, and some very isolated populations in New Hampshire, but we are very near that southern limit of the species. And to make things even more e exciting um, from someone who studies range limits a lot, we are at the very northern range limit or close to it of pitch pine shown here in the, in the pink. Um, and you can see here on the zoom in again, there are a few little populations up in very southern Quebec, but we're um, almost at its northern extent. And so we have this one site, this very unique site that is housing both of these species at opposing range limits. And with ongoing climate change, this is going to potentially lead to a very interesting dynamic where pitch pine, which is right now constrained to only a small portion of the Altona flat rock, might start to be growing a lot better and might expand its range. And that might happen at the expense of jack pine at its southern range limit where conditions would be expected to be becoming harsher and less favorable for its survival. And that's something that we'll come back to touch on in a few minutes. Okay, so getting to the actual 2018 fire, um, you can see here a drone image taken very shortly after the fire, just to orient uh, you, the um, bottom left of our screen is north of east um, in, in terms of direction, and the fire burned roughly from this northeast um, point to the southwest, so in uh, towards the top right of the image that you're looking at. It burned about 225 hectares or 557 acres, and it burned for um, just about one week, from July 12th to the 18th of 2018. The other thing that this um, image shows off really nicely and is a point that we're going to also come back to um, throughout the presentation is the heterogeneity of the site. And so you can see a lot of green areas within the burn extent um, that did not burn or did not burn nearly as severely um, due to them being look more low-lying areas, to, uh, wetlands through this um, extensive strip going through the center here portion of the burn. Um, there is several beaver ponds in that area. And these sites are really characterized by um, lower density jack pine, more broadleaf species such as uh, maple um, and birch and aspen, a little bit of oak, and um, wetland um, species also in the understory, not as dominated by blueberry and huckleberry. Some historical context, um, this fire that burned last year, um, which I just said was 225 hectares, was the first um, significant fire really in 60 years. In 1958, about um, 1,200 hectares or 3,000 acres burned. There was a very small fire in 1965 that only burned um, 16 hectares. Um, and then there had been no fires um, at the Altona Flat Rock since that time. Um, the area that did burn in 2018 was all part of the area that burned in 1958. I'm not showing this uh, data, but part of a class project. Last semester, they aged uh, the standing, um, now dead trees um, throughout the, the 2018 fire, and they all um, dated to within five years or so following that 1958 fire. So this was all part of that um, 1958 burn, what we're talking about today. And then also on this slide, just some pictures to give you a sense of the, the fire suppression and containment um, operations that were going on during that week in July last year. Okay, so why was this fire so important ecologically? I'm sure that most of the audience, you know, um, knows this, but it is worth um, spending some time on um, because of how important it is. That jack pine is a serotonous species. The uh, cones of jack pine do not open until they are heated um, to roughly between 50 and 60 degrees Celsius. Um, and what we're looking at here is a picture of a cone uh, freshly opened after the fire has gone through. It's beautiful um, red color when it when it does open up. And those of you who have seen closed jack pine cones know they, they don't look nearly as, as pretty perhaps. But once the fire goes through, the cones open up and they release um, a significant amount of seed. Um, with mature stands of jack pine um, containing about 5 million seeds per hectare in unopened cones in the seed bank um, that is being retained um, until a disturbance like this fire comes through and allows those to open. The fire also clears the understory um, of competing uh, vegetation, in this case the, the blueberry and huckleberry primarily, 
um, and allows the jack pine to get a, a jump start on regenerating. And we see here a picture of um, you can just get a sense of the number of cones and, and you know, and think about all of the seed coming out of those cones that is now littering this otherwise barren forest floor, exposed mineral soil that the jack pine can germinate on. The other important uh, player in how this site is going to, you know, go through a successional process following the fire is the understory vegetation. Like I already said, blueberry and huckleberry form a dense understory at the flat rock. These are both species that uh, regenerate very quickly and are very prolific at following a fire. Um, there has been work done that shows that um, vaccinium species, um, both their, in terms of density and, and seed crop, um, correlates well with fire intensity. And so areas that were burned more um, intensely are going to have um, better and quicker um, understory regeneration. And this is really important for uh, bears, other frugivores. And it's also important to think about in the context of how these understory species are going to compete with the jack pine seedlings and dictate the, the successional pathway. The other understory player that's worth mentioning is bracken fern, which also regenerates very quickly following disturbance. Um, typically, um, you see bracken fern um, population declines um, over the, uh, the decade following um, uh, fire disturbance due to competition with the, with the woody understory species. And one of the really interesting things at play here is that while fern is um, attractive to, to insects such as ants, it is not a preferred browse species by deer. And so the interaction of how deer might be suppressing um, other vegetation and allowing the fern to flourish might play a role. And, and something Danielle will, will touch on later, but that we also started doing is we've built deer exclosures um, within the burn and in reference for its conditions to try to see how these dynamics play out. Okay, and so what happened right after the fire? The picture on the, on the left is the one that I just had up a second ago of that very barren forest floor littered in cones and we can, you know, assume all of that jack pine seed. And within a few weeks, by the end of August into early September, we started seeing massive amounts of jack pine seedling regeneration. These little seedlings poking up within only a few weeks following the burr. And kind of going along with that, we also saw kind of immediate fern regeneration and in the bottom picture there, the beginnings of the uh, re-sprouting of the blueberry and huckleberry coming up. So this all happening very, very quickly. And moving forward a year, we see that the blueberry and huckleberry have increased significantly in their cover. They're not as tall in, in stature or um, quite as dense as they are in the um, unburned areas of the flat rock but they are well on their way to, to a full recovery. And the jack pine seedlings are also doing very well. We now have um, 20 uh, centimeter plus jack pine seedlings occurring throughout the, the burned area. And so taking a step back from that and thinking about things a little more theoretically for a minute, we can think about the successional pathway of this jack pine barren ecosystem where starting in the in the bottom left here where we have this mature roughly 60 year old um, jack pine forest that grew out of the the 1958 fire a disturbance has has come along such as last year's fire and has killed that um, that uh, generation of jack pine um, removed the understory and released that massive seed bank that those trees have been storing for the last several decades now out of that disturbance event, we get regeneration of the jack pine, also of the other species that we've uh, just been talking about. And over the course of the next 50 years or so, we would expect to see a return to that previous state. Something that we've been thinking a lot about and that we think is very interesting in this, and this goes back to, think, um, to when I talked about jack pine being at its very southern range limit, is this idea of resilience debt or a loss of resilience in a system due to misalignment of, of adaptations is all that in that box information legacies is referring to 
uh, and disturbance, but which is only apparent after the system is disturbed. And this may arise due to a change in disturbance regime or conditions required for recovery. And what we may be seeing happening at the Altona Flat Rock is that with changing environmental conditions, things haven't gotten so bad that the mature trees were, were noticing this, you know, and everything was fine in that mature um, late succession for, for this ecosystem um, community. But now that a disturbance has happened and reset the clock, are things still suitable climatically, environmentally for these seedlings and, and saplings as they potentially grow over the next couple of decades? Are we going to see a return to the same um, forest community that we have in the past? Conditions in the Champlain Valley are changing. What you're looking at here on the left is the annual um, temperature anomaly and, and fall temperature anomaly fall being the, the season that has changed uh, the greatest with, in terms of temperature increases. But two to three degree temperature increases since the early 1900s um, in um, these climatic factors. And while, like I said, for the mature trees, this might not matter that much, they may be able to sustain themselves just fine. This might matter a lot to the much um, lower, um, narrower tolerance uh, for climatic change of the seedlings and, and saplings. And so what happens to all these sap, um, seedlings that have germinated is going to be really interesting to track over the coming years and decades, because maybe this isn't going to return to the jack pine dominated forest that it has been in the past. And that really brings us to thinking about what our overarching um, goals and objectives were for all of the work that we're now um, going to talk about and that we've started um, sampling, measuring, and, and assessing at the, at the Flat Rock. And our overall objective is to assess the recovery and resilience of, of this ecosystem in response to wildfire with kind of a subset of goals of, of looking at how fire severity um, varied across the wildfire extent and how that plays into all these other things that we're going to speak about. Um, monitoring jack pine stand structure and seedling regeneration, assessing soil properties, particularly carbon storage potential across the fire and adjacent and nested uh, wetlands, and monitoring vertebrate and invertebrate community composition. And so starting very soon after the fire um, last year, we started setting up a network of, of sampling and, and observational points um, where we would be able to look at all of these things. This is a satellite image of um, the Altona Flat Rock, and you can really clearly see in this image the extent of the burn um, and the fire break shown, you know, that shows up as this white line around the, the perimeter of the burn. You can see that all the heterogeneity that I talked about before from the drone images as well, where these dark purple areas are, are that exposed sandstone pavement, um, and also areas that burned very um, intensely um, down to the, um, to the greener areas that are these wetlands that burned um, far less intensely um, than their surrounding, than the, than the surrounding site. And within this area, we set up a permanent plot network that consists of six transects that span the, the kind of length and breadth of the burn um, and are located 600 meters apart from each other. Um, and then along each of those transects, we placed plots that are now permanently marked. There's 45 of them in total. And they start on the kind of right-hand side here. The first plot along each transect is 200 meters outside of the burn in reference forest conditions. So we have a good sense of what we're comparing things to within the, the fire extent. Um, the next set of plots is right along the fire edge um, so that we can look at whether or not there are different dynamics playing out in that you know, fire um, unburned interface. And then the other plots are within the fire and really capture with this number of plots and, and uh, systematic layout, capture the heterogeneity across the entire burn area. At each of those 20 by 20 meter plots, we tallied all the standing trees by species and diameter class. Um, to determine pre-fire stand structure. We calculated um, canopy closure. We collected soil samples um, to be able to look at soil moisture and organic carbon. 
Uh, we determined species specific uh, ground cover and we tallied jack pine regeneration um, in three nested um, one by one meter subplots within each of those 20 by 20 meter subplots. We also determine fire severity using a one to five um, index. Kind of pictures here as reference um, from the unburned one to the five or deep burning or crown fire where the canopy trees are all dead and needles have been, been consumed. And then two through four being intermediaries um, between those two extremes. And so getting into some results, we can map that, those uh, fire severity uh, classifications um, on for our 45 plots. And you can see um, very nicely that the, you know, all the reference plots came out as, as ones or unburned, unsurprisingly. Um, and then within the, the burned area, we get a mix of two through fives with the twos and threes, those light blues and yellows really lining up very nicely um, to, to a large degree with those wetter areas um, that did not burn as severely due to moisture levels and, and um, species composition as the uh, pink and dark purple areas where you see most of the fours and, and fives in terms of fire severity. <clears throat> so if we just think quickly, um, briefly, I just want to show you the, the pre-fire jack pine density that we measured across these 45 plots. And what you see is that in the unburned or reference um, condition forest, we've got just over 2000 um, jack pine per hectare. And if you ignore the, um, the unburned plots for a minute and just look at uh, fire severity two through five, you see that there is a correlation, uh, it's about 0.4 between fire severity and the uh, pre-existing stand density where denser stands did burn on average more intensely, but there's also a lot of variation um, within that. But overall, the take home from this slide um, that I wanna leave you with is that you know, the average um, pre-fire um, forest density for the jack pine was around 2000 trees per hectare. And that becomes really important now when we look at the regeneration. And so now we're looking at regen or jack pine seedlings in stems per hectare on the y-axis and again against fire severity on the x-axis. And you'll notice that the scale has changed dramatically where now we're looking at um, seedling densities per hectare in you know, the hundreds of thousands of seedlings um, with there being you know, no um, regeneration because cones did not open in the unburned reference plots, but then almost uh, um, around 50,000 um, seedlings per hectare in the um, low fire severity classes going up to an average of over 500,000 seedlings per hectare in the severest areas of the burn. What also needs to be noted here though is the amount of variance in, in this data and that that variability in seedling density increases um, with the increasing fire severity as well. And that's really important because we need to think about microsite, um, very fine scale, sub one meter scale differences in microsite topography, in where moisture is pooling, in how the understory um, blueberry, huckleberry, and ferns are competing with these species. And that's having a big effect at these very, very fine scales. Now, the green line that's just come up on the plot is that average pre-fire stand density from the previous slide of 2,000 stems per hectare. And it comes up here on, at this scale is pretty much you know, at the zero point. And so we need to think a lot about how, and it's going to be fascinating to see how this plays out, how these um, seedlings that are now numbering in the hundreds of thousands reduce themselves to this, you know, only 2,000 or so stems per hectare and how that happens or at what stage I should say that happens. If that's going to happen quickly over the next couple years as seedlings or if it's going to be happening um, more through the sapling stage um, on kind of a decadal time scale. Take homes from this though are that the majority of seedlings germinated with a month following the fire um, and that we see this really heterogeneous dis, uh, distribution at very fine scales 
based on these microsite conditions. Danielle is going to take over at this point. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to speak on behalf of Mary Aldred and her students who evaluated the carbon storage potential, not only across the severity of the burn extent, but also in many of the wetlands that were found within. So um, in terms of the carbon budgets, on the left hand side, you'll notice sort of the schematic that shows uh, the pools that you might find in an unburned, what we call a reference stand. On the right hand side, what you'll notice is that largely during a burn, the majority of that carbon is returned to the atmosphere. And so the question was, will wetlands behave similar to the unburned reference sites in regards to soil carbon? And so in doing so, the students in her wetland ecology course, and I believe her biogeochemistry course in the spring, um, they may have run the samples, but what they did was they ran four transects um, and at every um, it was 16 meter transects, I should say, and at every four meters, they pulled soil, um, they got wet weights, dry weights, um, and then they ashed this in order to determine organic carbon. And findings from the wetland survey was that as distance uh, from wetland increased, there was a decline, a dramatic decline in soil organic carbon storage potential. Uh, the closer you were to the wetland uh, and the more moist areas, the more the soil organic carbon profile looked similar to that of a reference stand. And when we looked across the extent of the fire, as Mark mentioned earlier when he put up the schematic of our transects, we had uh, reference unburned sites, we had um, plots that ran along the edge as well as within the burn. And what you'll notice is the percent soil organic carbon, there was actually no significant difference um, in the carbon profiles that we found. There was an increase in soil organic carbon um, as we saw more moisture within the soil, which is similar to what we found in the wetland surveys. And in the middle schematic here, which you'll notice is actually quite surprising, that as fire severity increased, we did not necessarily see um, the trends we would have expected in soil organic carbon. And because I was the person who tried to dig for soil, and I should say that with all emphasis, trying to find any soil up here is, is a tricky um, endeavor. And so oftentimes where we would find soil in the burn happened to be areas that were a little more moist. So I think that's what might explain the trends that we're seeing here. We'll be following up on that uh, in further classes. Now moving on to vertebrate response, uh, we had some predictions. Uh, we assumed that uh, due to the intensity of the burn, we would see um, much uh, less activity from our browsing organisms. So seeing fewer deer and snowshoe hare, we'd probably see an increase in granivores, those eating the seeds. Um, and we would probably see an increase in the um, carnivores uh, tracking in on those um, smaller mammals in the burn. In order to do this, there were actually a few approaches that we took. Uh, I should say that probably the most lucrative and exciting from my standpoint was uh, using the game cameras. So what you'll notice up here in the map is that we had two sites that we targeted in our unburned reference and we had two within the burn. Uh, each of those sites having two game cameras set about uh, 0.5 meters from the ground. Um, they were recording images every 15 seconds. We did some post hoc removal so we didn't double count any uh, individuals. And we analyzed these using a cam trap package in our studio, which allowed us to look at seasonal and daily movements of these animals. And our findings um, showed that animals were more active in the unburned reference plots. Uh, what was interesting um, was, again, seeing increases in deer and snowshoe hare, these browsers uh, in our unburned area, which we would expect. Um, but seeing more of the red squirrel, uh, perhaps a predation risk um, issue, uh, and they're choosing to be in the unburned um, more so. We see uh, a, 
a little bit of an increase in coyote in the burn, but um, not much. And then rare sightings on some of these um, other animals, which you'll see some pictures of throughout the next couple of slides. Uh, and so if we were to look at the number of occurrences that were found uh, on these game cameras, you'll notice that the unburned sites collected a lot more images um, and the most severely burned um, camera plot had fewer um, animals. And again, just pointing out, we had some really exciting sightings, Bobcat and Fisher in particular, um, that uh, got myself and students uh, very excited. When we pull out seasonality uh, and consider deer movement, what we're noticing is in the spring and the winter, and I should say our spring camera data, um, it was not a complete spring. So we have now pulled that information and we'll be processing it. So this was only until May, um, our spring sampling. Uh, but you'll notice there's really not a difference in preference between the unburned and burned in those seasons. However, in the fall, perhaps due to rutting behaviors, we see them more frequently in the unburned. Uh, when we lay uh, by plots of predator and prey, we have coyote and white-tailed deer, coyote being the dash um, blue lines in both of these plots, unburned and burned. And you'll notice that the deer in the darker um, are crepuscular uh, in their activity. So they're active around 9 a.m. and again, uh, later in the day, whereas we have nocturnal behavior for the most part being observed um, by the coyotes. Uh, you'll notice a little more tight uh, temporal separation uh, with predator and prey in the burn again, perhaps because they're more out in the open. But I think one of the most exciting things um, that we were able to pull from this game camera um, was that for the most part in our uh, fall and spring, we see coyote being more active uh, in the burn. However, that switches over to the unburned site in the winter season where they are exclusively um, finding snowshoe hair. So snowshoe hair are only in that unburned during that period of time. And when we overlay our deal movement, um, again, we can see predator and prey tracking. So blue being our coyote um, active at night and we're also seeing uh, snowshoe hair active during that same period of time and in burn and unburned um, their activity uh, is largely suggesting that they're targeting their prey. We set a series of trap lines along those transects uh, where students in my wildlife course went and monitored Sherman traps. So these are live traps uh, they baited them with the typical um, rolled oats and um, sunflower seeds, as well as some mealworms to appease the insectivores. And they gathered metrics, including species, gender, uh, weight, and length. They did mark recapture as well, um, using ear tags on these animals. And our findings suggest that the unburned uh, was used more so than the burned. Uh, what is interesting to note and uh, should be uh, noted here Back in 2008, we did some surveys in the Jack Pine um, on another side of the Jack Pine uh, barren that was unburned. Um, and we largely had much fewer captures than we did in comparable northern hardwood forests just adjacent. So we would have expected not to see a high frequency of trap um, success. However, we did, um, and the students were quite busy and excited about that. And you'll notice. These dots here represent trap uh, counts. So we had a lot more activity in the unburned area um, than we did in the burned. And when we break it out by species, what you'll notice is that we are dominated in both unburned and burned sites by paramiscus, which are um, the mice, deer mice and white-footed mice in our area. Um, in the unburned, we're picking up a couple of different shrews, these insectivores. Um, and again, uh, seeing more paramiscus in jack pine um, or any stand in our area uh, is very typical. So it's sort of what we would have expected. We also turtled. Um, so again, in my wildlife class, there was a group who surveyed not only the burn uh, wetlands. So this is the upper uh, northwestern pond right here, the larger one. Uh, but they also surveyed in comparison to some wildlife management areas. What we did was we followed the um, Ecological Research and Vegetation Network, ERINS, turtle pot protocol, which requires us to hoop trap for three days in a row. So they uh, pulled traps and checked twice. Uh, 
did mark recapture um, along the scoots, got some measurements um, along the shell, as well as the nail and precloacal tail for gender and age. We also ran some water chemistry samples um, to evaluate whether or not that could have been um, a reason why or, or maybe why we are, are seeing different patterns. And what we will notice here is a big goose egg. Um, the students did not see any turtles in their survey here at the fire. Um, and in comparison, looking at water chemistry, pH, conductivity, and um, total suspended solids, uh, this site was quite different from all the others, likely due to the bedrock sandstone pavement. Uh, Tim, my hooks class in um, the spring, but also independent study students in the fall, as well as my wildlife students, uh, chose to survey some invertebrates. Uh, and la largely what I've learned, because I'm not an insect person, but it's been kind of neat to look into the literature. We would expect to see fewer insects because not only are we losing them to the burn, especially those that are ground dwelling, uh, but also they're losing their resources. And there's gonna be expected to be a lot of site-specific uh, site as well as species-specific responses. Uh, and even in a very short time period, this is months after the fire. So you see an immediate response of ants to increase, um, but then there, there's an immediate decline. So. Um, we're expecting to see some of these changes as we continue going through the samples. There's quite a lot of, um, of samples that uh, students and uh, faculty are going through at this point. And so uh, in the fall of 2018, so at, shortly after the fire, uh, we used two different sampling methods. Uh, Tim Myhook and students set out malaise traps. These are going to be long-term monitoring um, uh, sort of net net tent traps over here. They're going to largely um, be biased towards uh, flying insects. And the same is true of the UV light sampling that we used. Um, and so my students went out just for one evening using UV light in a sheet uh, to collect their samples. And what you'll notice is, and, and I just put this up here to, to show that if we had only used the malaise trap, we would not have seen a difference in the abundance of uh, invertebrates in both sites. However, because we did that UV light sampling, we noticed a lot more insects in the burn in, uh, shortly after the, uh, the fire. And the students got a chance, um, and this is from the wildlife class, to go through and do some invertebrate uh, taxonomic ID, uh, quite a few and some interesting ones. And when we break it out by species, again, just the fall samples, uh, overwhelmingly in both uh, sampling methods we're seeing an overabundance uh, represented by diptera. So there were a lot of flies that were captured at these sites. Notice the diptera really responded uh, to the UV light. Again, uh, that's going to bias towards some uh, flying insects as well. Um, but there also were a lot of coleoptera. And from the readings, what I'm finding is that they often respond to some of the smoke. So this could be a kind of a short term pulse that we might see as a result of that. When we look long term and compare just the malaise traps, and these are the ones that we have um, many sampling um, bouts uh, to, to process, you'll notice uh, again early on uh, the fall following the burn, not much of a difference uh, in the abundance of, of insects that were uh, collected. However, when we look at more recent samples, so a year later, um, we're seeing about three times as many insects in the unburned as compared to the burned. But this may perhaps just be the result of um, what we're expecting to be seasonal pulses. So this, this would be uh, animals that are uh, reproducing. So one year later, again, the trends are uh, once again showing us diptera being one of the most common um, species. Um, you'll notice species richness has increased a year later. Uh, and we're also seeing uh, an increase in uh, individuals of different orders. So hymenopter, a lot of um, ichnomid wasps, the parasitic wasps, um, and perhaps their prey, Lepidoptera. Um, and so uh, there is a response that we're seeing. And again, that pulse that we're seeing here could just be the result of uh, seeing a spring pulse in insects. And it'll be important for us to go back and sample um, for another spring. In terms of spatial distribution, um, when we evaluate, you'll notice there were higher abundances of insects in the unburned than we see in the burn. And the most severe of our sites where that malaise trap is located, you'll notice there are much fewer um, insects that were captured. And so in conclusion, uh, what we're finding is uh, 
<laughs> Mark is going to tell us what we're finding. <laughs> well, for this slide at least. Um, so yeah, just to, uh, some quick conclusions. Um, so overall, one year following the fire, um, in terms of jack pine regeneration, like I said before, it's highly heterogeneous at, at fine spatial scales. Overall, the more severe the burn, the more seedlings there are, but like I talked about, there's a lot of variability at, at fine spatial scales within that. Um, seedling numbers far exceed mature stand density, which is unsurprising, but it's going to be really fascinating to see how we reduce, how seedling numbers are reduced um, to that mature stand density over the coming years and decades. And really, well, while seedling germination has been so successful um, in this first year following the, the fire, it remains to be seen how these seedlings are going to um, survive in the face of, of changing environmental conditions and compete with, with other species. And really just thinking about that, that concept of resilience debt and what's going to happen um, in terms of how this species, how jack pine is adapted to this disturbance regime and a certain set of climatic tolerances and the interaction of those two things changing over the coming decades. We also learned that wetlands uh, appear to serve as carbon sinks, um, which was an interesting um, point noted. Uh, we'll continue to uh, evaluate soil samples. In terms of wildlife, um, we see fewer uh, animals sighted in the burn, uh, which was to be expected. Uh, we are seeing temporal separation of deer and coyote in our burn, perhaps a predation risk. Um, uh, scenario. We're seeing also um, coyote and snowshoe hare temporally um, and seasonally overlap. So we're seeing the tracking of this uh, preferred prey species. And rodents very common in this area. That's kind of typical of northern hardwood forest and, and unsurprising in the jack pine. Um, not seeing insectivores likely uh, in the burn is likely a function of having um, lesser uh, ground dwelling insects in this area. And the turtles not being detected could just be um, a scenario in which we only had two trapping belts, so we just didn't capture them at that time. Uh, in terms of invertebrates, seeing a lot more diptera in these areas um, and more insects returning to the in the unburned area, uh, perhaps um, the trends that we're seeing right now are just a, a, an artifact of seasonality. So we'll be continuing to monitor these insects as the vegetation succeeds. And so in the future, we're going to continue um, evaluating seedling regeneration, uh, looking for survival and growth. Uh, as Mark mentioned earlier, we've established several um, uh, deer exclosures. Um, so we'll be able to look inside and outside to see how deer pressure is influencing this regeneration trend. Um, we will be going back to those wetlands as well as across the burn, um, trying to gather um, and ground truth a bit more uh, soil to, to better evaluate um, soil carbon. We'll be continuing game cameras um, and, uh, and also hoping to continue those same surveys that we did, but also maybe bring in birds. So perhaps teaming up with some collaborators um, in Audubon or um, who uh, are doing uh, some mist netting up in this area because Kirtland's warblers um, actually just heard something on NCPR about uh, them being closely tied to jack pine. And we'll hopefully bring on some more uh, varied uh, surveys of insects. So I'd, I'd like to really get at the beetles a bit more uh, by doing some other types of, uh, of work, uh, including maybe pitfall traps. I'm not even <laughs> sure that we could dig into them, but. Um, just a way to perhaps capture um, those ground dwelling insects a bit better. And so with that, um, that's the, the end of our presentation. We'd just like to acknowledge first and foremost the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange for giving us this opportunity, um, but also um, WH Minor Agricultural Institute, Nature Conservancy, and um, the New York um, Department of Environmental Conservation, who um, all um, um, have ownership of, of different parts of, of the, the Flat Rock property. Um, our funding for all of this research has come from um, the Center for Earth and Environmental Science, from the Minor Institute and the, the SUNY Research Foundation. And then, like I said at the very beginning, we can't thank enough all of our collaborators and 
and students that have made all of this possible. And I guess with that, um, we'll turn things back over to Amanda and hopefully we have time for questions. Yeah, we, we do have time for questions. Wow, thank you. That was a phenomenal presentation. Um, and I'm sure if people, if you have questions out there, please type them into the chat box and we'll try to address them pretty much in the order that you type them in. Um, for anybody else out there who just feels like, I want to learn more about this, please uh, come to our workshop, um, again, with the Science Symposium, which is going to really dig deeper into all the, all the work that um, Mark and Danielle have highlighted here. Um, and then the, an evening panel discussion focusing on kind of the operations of the wildfire and then the field trip where we get to go and look at these plots and really literally dig into the soil um, and get a better sense of what's going on. This is a really awesome site. Um, and it's phenomenal, all the work that you and all of your assistants and, and everybody has done um, to, to really help tell the story of this ecosystem um, in response to the wildfire. And there's even more research beyond just the wildfire effects that you're also going to get to highlight. So um, with that, we should probably turn to the, uh, to the, to the, the questions in the chat box. Um, Dr. Bill Patterson asks, um, are or were there also non serotonous cones on some trees at the site? On the main coast and elsewhere, both serotonous and non serotonous cones occur, sometimes on the same stem. It is thought to ensure perpetuation on sites where fires occur at intervals longer than the expected lifespan of the individuals in the stand. So, yeah, I can address that. So, yes, that, that's a, I just didn't get into all of the, the details of, of the cone serotony, but, but yeah, cone serotony is a variable trait in jack pine. You get trees that have completely open cones, um, trees with completely closed cones, um, and mixes of the two. And, and it also changes with the, the life stage of the tree. Younger jack pines often have um, some open cones um, on them, that then, uh, but then only produce closed cones at later points in their, um, in their lives um, as kind of a bet hedging measure um, interacting with, you know, whether or not a disturbance is, is going to happen or not. And so there are open cone trees in the site, but we did not find um, any seedlings um, in any of our, our reference plots. And so what I think is happening is even if seed is being released from some of these open cone, um, from these individuals that do have open cones, that the understory vegetation is so thick that these um, seeds are not being successful in, in germinating um, and or surviving past, you know, the, the initial germination phase. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just add quickly um, that we had another question about uh, if, if the researchers presenting would be willing to share their contact info. I, I, in the chat box, I just pasted in uh, the link to uh, Mark and Danielle's uh, bios on the, um, on the SUNY Classburg website, and I'm sure they'd be happy to refer you to the other researchers that were part of these studies as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, following, yeah, yeah. Um, and again, come to the workshop and get to dig in more in person. Um, following up on uh, Dr. Patterson's first question, he also asked, do you have any evidence for how long centuries, millennia, jack pine has persisted at Altona? And he said that Mount Desert Island pollen evidence uh, shows that jack pine has occupied the sites where small stands occur there for 3,000 plus years. However, prior to European settlement, there, uh, there, there the jack pine populations were far less dominant, uh, coincident with much longer fire intervals, estimated at 300 to 500 years or longer. The last fires of these stands were either 1947 and or in the late 19th century. So how long has Jack Pine persisted at Altona? That's a really awesome question. And we actually just went out last week and cored, used a Russian peat core in one of those wetland areas uh, within the burn um, and got a four and a half meter um, peat core that um, we're now going to be analyzing this fall, get some dates on, and hope we're going to be doing pollen um, and macro fossil analysis. We'll also be looking for charcoal and hopefully getting a, a fire uh, return interval um, out of that. And so hopefully within the next, um, you know, I'll be optimistic and say six months or so, we're going to have answers to that question. Right now, I don't think, I haven't been able to find any information. We don't have a good idea on how long the jack pine has been there. I'm so excited to look at the core, though. Nice. Yeah, well, thank you. And you obviously had already asked the question, and you're trying to answer it. So <laughs> thanks for doing that. Um, we had another question that came in. Uh, will it also be a follow-up over the next years of the burn severity on forest response for the low burn severity classes? And have these correlated with other studies done on the site? 
I guess will you keep following up uh, in you know in future years, um, you know, following the the response to the wildfire, um, and checking in the difference in, in response to the different burn severity classes? Yes. Yeah, definitely. That, I mean, we plan on on continuing, and that's why we've established this this permanent plot network, um, so that we can really you know do a detailed long term study of this site and and see the trajectory overall, but also within, yeah, the different burn severity classes is going to be, you know, really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I just gave this talk um, at the Ecological Society of America um, meeting last week. And I have to say that, that they're, what they found to be the most fascinating was the heterogeneity and how varied the response was just, you know, a, just a few meters away, things looking quite different. Um, the burn severity changing um, pretty dramatically at a small fine scale. Yeah, um, and that actually follows or link Inga's question and uh, follows closely on that. She asked, do you think the severity of this fire was unusual in its region? For example, um, there's no analog for this type of severity or as compared to the, the earlier fire from 60 years ago. Um, from the best I can tell from the, the records that we have of the fire, 60 years ago, this is, is comparable to that, I, I believe. Very interesting. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll be kicking dirt and digging into that uh, more in just a few weeks. Um, but yeah, thanks for your response. Now turning to insects. Uh, Steve asks, have you looked at the insect data uh, to family or even further? Asking because even though diptera are more abundant in the burned area, are they actually using the site or just being windblown through? And he says, also, the burned areas are more open, so light can radiate further than the unburned area, attracting more individuals. Same for the malaise trap. It's more open, so more insects can be blown through. Biasing the data? Question mark. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. And, and I can't speak for um, Tim and his students, but I know there's just so many samples, and we haven't had enough time to get into them yet. So um, at this stage, he had them sort to um, order. And I believe he's hoping to continue to do that to get through all the samples. We, I mean, these were only four malaise trap samples, um, one, one kind of two month, one month period, I, I wanna say. Um, and so there's a lot more insects to get through. And when he gets a student, um, at, as well as working with him um, to dig a little deeper, um, I think that's what the plan will be. But those are all great points. You know, I, I as a, as a mammal researcher, you know, I'm aware that the Sherman traps that I use are, are going to completely bias us towards a certain um, subgroup. And, um, and so I, I'm learning now all the biases that you find with these different insect traps. I think we just wanted yeah. to get, get out there and get something kind of permanently established um, and then be able to build on that. Yeah, you can't see me, but I'm nodding my head. That makes total yeah. sense. <laughs> Um, there are a couple more comments that came in. Um, some Coleoptera and Dipter species lay eggs in, the, in newly dead woods, which larvae eat, dot, dot, dot. And then the response, yes. So maybe those are the families to focus on, so Coleoptera oh, yeah. and Diptera. Yeah. yeah, these are all really good points that we're going to definitely share on, on the, our insert, insect experts. Nice. Yeah, well, you're, you're, you're certainly keeping the students busy. Um, well, I, we have one more question, <laughs> one more question uh, before we formally conclude, but I suspect you guys would be happy to stick around and answer additional questions. This is a good one to end on. Uh, Kevin asks, will one of your research objectives be to develop future management recommendations for this area? Um, I would say definitely yes, and that's something, you know, that we've been talking, um, already started talking with, with Neil Gifford. Um, especially about who manages the, the Albany Pine Barren and has a lot of, of um, research experience at the Altona Flat Rock as well. Um, I think that, you know, seeing over the next several years how the recovery um, plays out um, is going to potentially really, you know, have strong implications for, for what we um, what we would recommend. I'm, you know, cautious in, in, in and what I would say though that will be at this point, but but I think that yeah that this is going to you know have really um, direct implications on how this property is managed. I think the DEC is very interested in that, and um, and the Miner Institute in terms of how they manage their property as well. 
Uh, and I should also say, I'm, I haven't done any work on wildfires. So this was an excellent opportunity uh, for us to learn simultaneously with our students about uh, this sort of disturbance. Uh, and also uh, just to work with a bunch of different agencies to see these students um, really understand what um, the rangers were doing during the time of the fire, how Albany Pine Bush came up to assist, how the local fire departments all got involved. I think it's just been kind of a, a, a really immersive experience to expose our students to. So we were grateful that it was timed when it was and that we were able to just kind of mobilize all our resources and, and really use the fall semester to collect this baseline data. That is awesome. Uh, we're just a couple minutes after the top of the hour. Um, I'll say if folks need to jump off, uh, we totally understand. Um, thank you for joining us and uh, thanks very much to our presenters. And if you're able to stick around um, and if you have still have questions, I think we can stay for a few more minutes. Um, but please join me in a virtual round of applause for, for Mark and Danielle for giving a really excellent webinar. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm. Send us your students. <laughs> yeah. All right, so if folks have uh, questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, we're happy to keep the conversation going, um, and we hope folks will come to our workshop in September, just a few weeks away. We'll give folks a, a few moments. We're getting some thank yous. Aha, uh -huh. here's a question. What was your pre-fire stand density based on? Standing deadwood? Yes, that's exactly. We, we tallied um, and did diameter um, measurements on all of the, the standing um, deadwood and, and downed uh, whole trees that were remaining. All right. And uh, perhaps a dumb question, but those seedling counts, getting into hundreds of thousands, how did the students actually count all those seedlings? Right, so we did the seedling um, counts. So within that 20 by 20 meter plot, we randomly located um, three one by one meter plots and they count uh -huh. in those and then we scaled up to the, and so we were getting over, in some cases, you know, well over a hundred seedlings per one meter um, square. And that, you know, wow. you know translates to a million seedlings per hectare. And in, and in, many, yeah. cases, in many cases getting zero in, in plus. Right. And so it's so heter heterogeneity is just so uh, mm -hmm. pervasive. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to visit the site and sort of see how much of the heterogeneity is due to topography and soil moisture and microsite factors um, you know, versus the you know, fire behavior. Um, and of course, those are interrelated. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm already just being out there in the last week or so, there has been, and we'll, you know, be resampling this fall, there has been um, substantial seedling mortality just over this growing season. Um, I think mm. mostly due to, to, you know, ones that, uh, seedlings that germinated on drier uh, microsites and were not able to, to last through the summer um, due to, to moisture uh, limitations. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, we, have, we have a few more uh, questions. Bam, bam, bam. Here we go. So, how how will you identify jack pine in the core, in the pollen core? Uh, macro fossils or pollen? Right. Don't so definitely, definitely macro fossils, um, and and we will look at, at pollen as well. Pollen, pine pollen, not being species specific, but but it'll still you know just in terms of abundances give us a, a some sense of of things going on. Uh, but definitely macro fossils. All right. Um, we have another question. Why 200 meters into the unburned area versus something farther away or even closer? Um, that was a decision we made just in terms of setting up this, this systematic but comprehensive sampling network that was something that the students would be able to, to you know, to get to the plots and, and know where they were going and that we could, you know, easily access as well. Um, we do have lots of other plots that weren't part of the network we showed that have been um, 
set up at the throughout the Altona Flat Rock and other areas that did not were not part of the 2018 fire. Um, and so we have lots of other you know reference conditions um, as as well as as those plots. But in terms of this you know permanent network that we wanted to set up, that just seemed like the um, the best way to to move forward with that. Nice. Um, there's a quick follow up on the pollen question. You can identify mm -hmm. jack pine pollen as being smaller than white pine, red, uh, well, red pine and red pine. So uh, I guess jack pine pollen is smaller. So that's a, a okay. tip from Dr. Patterson. Great. Um, okay. I wasn't sure about that. So. <laughs> yeah, you know, you should definitely get in touch <laughs> with, yeah. uh, with Dr. Bill Patterson. You'll have a lot to talk about. Um, yeah. Inga asked another question. Is there any pitch pine establishing? So like I mentioned, the pitch pine is only located in the um, far southeast corner of the Altona Flat Rock, which is several miles from um, the area that burned. Um, and that's another, you know, whole research project where I'm really interested in the, the kind of transitions from being pure pitch pine into a mix of pitch and jack pine into just jack pine. And um, within that pitch pine area, there is a bit of regeneration and there are some sapling age trees, um, but there is not significant um, regeneration even in that pure pitch pine area in the, in the other. And you know how that would respond to, to a burn would be also really you know, fascinating. Interesting. Um, and related to that sort of climate change effect, um, Matthew asks, if climate change has an effect on regeneration success of jack pine, what would be the likely mechanism? Uh, so that's a really interesting question. Um, and it, you know, it could be a combination of, of things. Um, you know, so typically seedlings have, a, you know, a, a narrower, um, tolerance um, breadth to a range of, of whatever specific climate variable we might be thinking about, whether it's you know, growing season temperature, winter temperature, precipitation, whatever the case may be. And we might easily be moving outside of that um, response threshold um, with the seedlings versus you know, what the mature trees can, can sustain and, and continue to, to grow under. Um, at its southern range limit, um, we might expect that rising temperature would be the, the driving force in making things unsuitable for the jack pine seedlings. But uh, the caveat to that, I guess, would be that in, in some work done in, in the western parts of, of jack pines range, it's been found that at its southern range limit in, in Alberta, I believe was where the study was done, um, temperature was not um, a a dictating factor on the southern range limit. It was almost completely be being driven by precipitation. Um, and what's happening in the Champlain Valley in terms of climate change makes that kind of you know, confusing in a way, uh, but also really interesting, where we have rising temperatures, but we also have increasing uh, precipitation here. And so that could actually, you know, help facilitate jack pine, even though temperatures are, are becoming un, unsuitable. So it's not a straightforward um, answer like most things to do with, with climate change and species reactions to, to it. All right. But hopefully that helped to answer the question. <laughs> yeah, you got to thanks with an exclamation point. Oh, well. <laughs> um, Dr. Patterson clarified, he meant, uh, so jack pine pollen is smaller than white pine, red pine, or pitch pine. So okay. jack pine is, is much smaller than the other three. So Excellent. That should help. Yeah. Yeah, we're Great. really excited about getting this core and, uh, and starting to, to dig into it. Nice. All right, we'll give folks another moment to, uh, to type any final questions that they might have. Um, while folks may be typing, I'll just say again, the, uh, this workshop is coming up on uh, Friday, Saturday. Um, September 13th and 14th. Um, so there's a science symposium featuring all the research that uh, these great students have done and other scientists um, over the years uh, with a focus on uh, the research since the wildfire. 
um, that will be Friday afternoon. In the evening, we have a panel discussion uh, with, the, with, the, with folks from the, from the local fire department um, and from New York State D, uh, DEC, um, and also on um, also just focusing on the on the kind of commu community response to wildfire, since they're not as used to seeing wildfire as once upon a time. We'll get some historical perspective, but um, what does it mean going forward? Um, and then on Saturday, we'll get to combine both the wildfire operations and the fire ecology with a visit to the Flat Rock site. So please register, join us. You're going to have a great time and get uh, have a really fun time uh, getting to dig in and, and see all this stuff in the Jack Pine Forest in person. All right. I don't see any more questions, so I think we are probably able to let folks go. Um, once again, a huge, huge thank you uh, to Mark and Danielle for your presentation. This is this is a wonderful, wonderful webinar, and we really appreciate your taking the time to share all of your work and your students' work with us. Well, thank you, you very much. It was yeah. uh, it was our pleasure. All right. Hope we see everyone at the at the workshop. Yeah, come visit. <laughs> yeah. It's a real treat. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks.